My brother, my partner, welcome back to your home in New York, to the 92nd Street Y. I'd like to take a moment to mention a couple of people um, who were instrumental in bringing us together, because the 92nd Street Y brought us together in this partnership of Justice for Kurds. I'd like to mention Thane Rosenbaum, who's in the audience with us, and a great friend of this institution, Rana Gam, Charlie Rose. We've had a number of mutual friends who have served in bringing us together for a great cause, not to mention a great friendship. Bernard Henri, you are someone who is widely acknowledged, rightly, as being the foremost advocate for the Kurdish people in the West. How did you come to engage with the Kurds, and how do you think you see the situation now? How did I come to that? By, um, by heart and by knowledge. By heart, rather recently, because I have the sense of honor, because these ladies and gentlemen did fight for us and often without us because we owe them a lot, because we have a debt, because they were our rampart and shield and sword in the darkest time of the ISIS. So when, I, uh, when we created together Justice for Curls, I had just the feeling to pay a debt I knowledge and knowledge also because I, I, I know since long, since the, nine, the beginning of the 90s, that this Islam, which we are all of us searching, this moderate Islam, democratic Islam, enlightened Islam, matching with secularism and equality between women and men, this Islam that we pretend to look for all over the West, in my country, desperately, it exists there, in the Kurd in all the Kurdistan, if I dare say. Maybe we will speak of that. So for me, uh, this is not a question of honor. This is a question of consistency. Do we genuinely or not look for this uh, great Islam compatible with our creeds? with the Western creeds or not. If we do, we have to ask to support the Kurds and we have to demand justice for the Kurds. This is my, my state of mind. You have made films about the Peshmerga, about the fall of Mosul. What took you into Iraqi Kurdistan? What I just said, Plus my, my, my wish all my life, as often as I can, to have my deeds matching with my creeds. This uh, uh, is a concern which I had since my remote youth. Not just talk, not just words, words, words. If I can, to, to, to make my, my life uh, matching with that. And for me it was very important. When I, when I understood in 2015 that these guys and ladies were waging this fight, which, I, which we all know, I decided to, to, to be embedded with them. I decided to, to follow their fight, which is ours. I decided to bear testimony for them. I decided to share their life. And I spent from, uh, uh, in 2015, a uh, few months of my life, in and out of course, sharing their daily life, uh, witnessing their, their battles. Uh, and then when, they, when they, the battle of, uh, for the liberation of Mosul occurred, uh, which was such a, an important event, uh, there was the fall of Raqqa, but before the fall of Mosul, again, I wanted, for me it was a, a request, it was a need. I left President Massoud Barzani um, with this demand, when you go to Mosul, please let me know. I want to be at your side. I want to have the honor again to be 
able to be testimony for your bravery, for your own creed, and so on. And this is what, what, what they did. And I feel so honored, honestly, that they did trust me enough to make me um, witness of things which they, of which no one else had been uh, made witness. I was there when they, when they planned the, an offensive. I was there when they, when they attacked. I was there when they, all of that. And this for me was um, a, great, uh, a great treat, honestly. It was uh, so, so important. They are the Peshmergas, the, the Kurds in general, and those Kurds whom I know, the Iraqi ones. They are men of honor. I know what it means for them to share bread with a foreigner on the battlefield, on the front line. And I felt uh, humbled and honored to be permitted that. And when my film was um, selected in the Film Festival of Cannes, which is, as you know, the best place for a film to be, I was, I was pleased for myself also, of course. I was pleased for my, my little team. We did this film with a very tiny crew. But I was proud for and happy for them. Uh, I was happy for General Sirwan Barzani, who is one of the heroes of both the, the films. I was proud for the, the late and dead uh, General Magdi Darki, who dies in front of the camera in Peshmerga. And I knew that um, where he was, or at least his uh, heirs and sons and so on, would be so proud to have him getting this recognition. So for me, it was, um, it was evident. W when, I, when I knew that I had the, the, the possibility of doing that, I rushed. I found the money, I found the producer, I recruited the, the team. We made a, a very strange agreement, the team and myself. We knew that there was no insurance uh, able to insert such a movie. So we made a sort of uh, uh, childish, but uh, in a way, honorable deal that we, we would take this risk, and we made it. And, um, and when I, I said to Than Rosenbaum just before entering, when we were in the green room, that the other day uh, there was a screening of Peshmerga in the New York Times uh, Center. And I, I saw again half of the movie. And this movie shot in 2015, when when it is seen in the light of the recent events of this incredible betrayal committed by the, admi the American administration and by the West in general, when these images take such a different uh, shape, they are so moving. It's even, in a way, I'm sad to say that I would have loved at the New York Times Center to think that this was history. I was proud to have done it, but no. It is burning actuality. The, these, these faces, which I left behind, I know that they are in hell. I know that they don't understand what has happened. I know that they have no explanation of the incredible, unprecedented attitude of the West, letting them down after having using them. And, um, and honestly, I cannot see <laughs> the image of my own movie without having uh, uh, tears uh, in, my, in, my, in my eyes. I saw a lot of things. But this, these faces, these souvenirs, uh, in the light of our unconceivable betrayal is probably the thing which makes me the more sad. And I'm so happy that, first of all, we made together in this brotherly way this JFK. And I'm so happy that tonight, uh, for this, at the end of the day, first public launching of, the F of JFK, that we are so numerous. It's so great that uh, you replied to, to, uh, to the call of the white, to our call, to, to hear about our brotherhood, and I will 
explain on that later because I, I have questions to ask you also. You are <laughs> but um, um, I'm so happy that um, we are so numerous here gathering to honor the girls. They used to say that in the moments of uh, tragedy, they have no other friends than mountains. This is a quote which Tom Kaplan likes to quote. Uh, but tonight, they, they see us. All, that, all this is, um, is filmed, live uh, tweeted or Facebook, or I don't know what. I know that they are looking at us. I know that they are aware of our meeting of tonight. And I'm happy if they feel that they have the mountains, but they have also a full packed house in this prestigious place where so many important things happened. When I saw Elie Wiesel the first time I came here in 1979, as for myself, in this place which uh, Tom Kaplan has been president, chairman of the boards, uh, and the founder of the, the, the Recanati Kaplan Talks, uh, I, I know that many girls in Iraq, in Syria, are watching us, and maybe it is a little balm on their terrible wound to know that at least in New York, they have this group of friends. Bravo. I think it's very fair to say that the Kurds could not have a better champion in the West than you. It's one of the great privileges of my life that when we met, we not only had common friends, but in many respects we bonded over a shared passion for the Kurds and for keeping their cause alive. Mine actually goes back decades. And until I met you, I had no way to be able to express it, despite the fact that I've been engaged in the Middle East for years. Um, I'm certainly engaged in the Gulf, um, in the Levant, in the Fertile Crescent, in saving cultural heritage. But until I met you, um, that level of activism was uh, untapped. And Schopenhauer said that man is caught between contemplation and the desire to act. And when one meets someone such as yourself, you become a trigger. And for me, I see you as one of those transformative influences in my life. And I think that anyone listening to the way that you've described the Kurds, their cause, would have to come away saying that their heart is moved. It's true that, as the Kurds say, they have no friends other than the mountains. And unfortunately, history has proven them right. Um, in 1975, they were betrayed by the Shah who signed the Treaty of Algiers to be able to get a few more meters of the Shat al-Arab. In the 1980s, in 1988, Talabja, the Anfal campaign. And yet, there's something particularly sinister, diabolical, debauched, in the way in which the United States has just betrayed one of the closest and most effective allies that we've ever known. After years of exhortation that our friends in the region should pull their weight and throw more resources into the battlefield, but with our support, rather than Americans being the tip of the spear, the Kurds did just that. The SDF, the YPG, these are acronyms for essentially the Kurdish-led forces, which were fighting Daesh, they lost 11,000 dead, 23,000 wounded. They took 30% of the country. They took Raqqa. America lost fewer than 10 people. 
this is one of the most asymmetrical expressions of alliance that we've ever had. And yet, they were discarded in ways that you wouldn't treat a dog, like Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. This is the way they were treated. The people who delivered us Baghdadi, you talk about the ultimate irony, the people who won the war for us so that our streets and the streets of Europe would be safer. They've been treated in ways that you wouldn't treat your worst enemy. When you were making your film, your films, you were dealing with the Iraqi Kurds, who of course were as heroic as what we've seen with the Syrian Democratic Forces. Did you anticipate that they too would be abandoned as they were, the Iraqi Kurds? Yes, uh, they were abandoned already. We, we, we tend, the press and all of us, we tend to have a short memory, but what is happening these weeks with the Syrian Kurds happened exactly as you well know, two years ago with the Iraqi Kurds. When the Iraqi Kurds, after having um, won their part of the battle against ISIS, decided to make a referendum of autodetermination as a sort of uh, normal uh, rewarding. America already let them down. All the West let them down. The only country who recognized their right to organize this referendum, there was one country in the world, which was Israel, the only one. So, of course, this, this is a, a long trend in the Western um, uh, history and in the American history. And what makes us, I think, all of us, so sad about this dual betrayal, October 2017, Iraqi Kurds. Today, October, uh, November, October 2019, the Syrian Kurds. Is that, of course, we betray, you, you, you described it perfectly, our best friend, our best ally. And best ally means, by the way, ally, allies uh, in arms and in creed, which is rare. America had a lot of allies in her history. France had a lot of allies with whom we did not share really values. It was Absolutely. real politics. Uh, we, okay, it's an efficient ally. We close the eyes on the fact that they don't share exactly our principles. With the Kurds, the two were there. The brotherhood in arms and the fraternity in creed. This is very rare. You know better than me the history of military alliances, the chessboard of the, on, of the Middle East. You know that by heart. And I don't know so many precedent of such a 100% alliance. But what I think depresses um, all those uh, ladies, gentlemen, whom I meet, with whom I speak in America, as in Europe, is that by doing so, we are shooting in our own feet, in our own foot. For, the, for America itself, for the deterrence of the West, for the moral um, um, uh, principles of the West, it is a disaster. I don't know, and again, you know that better than myself, probably, uh, for the Middle East, for sure. I don't know one ally of the United States of America who is not reflecting at the minute where we are speaking now, who is not reflecting on what happened to the Kurds. I'm sh I know or I guess that in Riyadh, in Abu Dhabi, in Israel, in, uh, in Seoul, in Taiwan, you have some strategists who are wondering, but at the end of the day, what happened to the Kurds could happen to anyone. A great country, the greatness of a country is made, of course, of uh, strength, uh, weaponry, logistics, and so on. But 
the most valuable weapon is the faithfulness, the fidelity to word. And when this fidelity is broken, you know that, we know that, uh, in the history of civilization, since the, the ancient Greeks, when this is broken, it is the most difficult to rebuild. You can rebuild an arsenal of weapons. You can reshape an, an army, whatever. You cannot repair a destroyed creed. And this is probably the most concerning in this situation. America and the West after America has created, has self-inflicted, we, we did self-inflict to us this strategic, moral, disaster. We have entered, really it is a sort of butterfly effect, with this betrayal of the curse, we have entered in a new world. We have turned a page in history where the world in, of America, for a time which will last, I don't know how, equals zero. When Europe has proved that it not exists in the map of the world, Europe, which is the the, 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 the cradle of so many values of the, of politically speaking, at least uh, the best of civilization, is now a non-existing entity. And what happens? You have Mr. Erdogan, uh, Mr. Khamenei, Mr. Putin, who are not exactly our friends, who brag, who take advantage, who occupy the vacuum, and who push their positions. So all that, it is a disaster for the Kurds and the misery, and it is a, a sort of strategic suicide for us. Now I would like to ask you one question, uh, uh, Tom, if you, if you allow me. One question. No, no ser ser seriously. Uh, you are, um, you are f uh, before knowing you, by the way, I knew you already through France. Uh, it was not, we were introduced by the two friends you quoted, but I knew about you as a, lo a lot of Frenchmen through France, through President Hollande and then President Macron, about your, your commitment, uh, um, uh, your um, humanitarian commitment and so on. But you were famous, this is the first way in which I heard the first uh, about you, you are famous about the uh, having predicted in before 1990 the invasion of Kuwait by Saddam Hussein. This is the first thing I heard when France President Hollande told me about you when you were preparing to 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 be to make Alif to 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 help the Museum of Ability. This is the first thing he told me. After that. Uh, I know you are quoted for that also to have predicted that the Iranian deal of Barack Obama will have as an outcome a general retreat of America in the area, in Iraq, etc. Again, you were proved to be right. But if I dare mention a, a private story, I hope you will not um, mind. In last July, we had a lunch in Paris in July. And you told me, and when you told me that, I said, okay, it's another prediction. You told me, we were in end of June. You told me, we are going to see very soon on the chessboard of the Middle East a new development of the uh, conflict between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. You told me uh, Israel has uh, uh, hit some positions, some Hezbollah positions in Lebanon. Iran will react, will retaliate by shooting oil fields in Saudi Arabia. I was a little surprised <laughs> and you told me, can I pursue or not? Okay, you told me it will happen just before the Israeli elections, end of June, <laughs> you even told me, you saw how my eyes were like uh, uh, balls, 
You told me it will happen a few days before Israeli election. It will happen at night at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the reality is that it happened three days before the election at 3.30. You see, I got it wrong. So, OK, you had it wrong. <laughs> but a bit of the story was right. Can you explain us and me, because I did not dare to, I don't know, we did not have the occasion, how did you <laughs> come <laughs> to such uh, uh, analysis and prediction? Honestly, I, if, you can, if you can reply to that. Because it's, it's the most incredible story which, <laughs> which happened to me with a friend. I seem to have a franchise in being able to predict uh, the, the actions of um, very miserable Iraqis and Iranians. Um, it's a thing. Um, my wife had to get over it um, because she was doing her military service when I made this prediction about Saddam Hussein invading uh, Kuwait. And I shared this with the Israelis um, and I shared it with the Saudis. I was a doctoral student at that time, traveling back between England and, and Israel to be with her. And nobody believed me. And it ended up making my career. Someone looked at that and said, wow, if someone can see around corners, maybe I can use that. And I was hired by an Israeli named David Tiomkin, who became my first mentor. And we started to advise some of the most prominent money managers in New York. And I was able to use history to be able to give me a relative advantage in predicting how things would unfold. And it's true, I do have something of a, uh, of a strong suit when it comes to the Middle East. Now, <laughs> the irony, of course, is that that attack at 3.30 in the morning on the refinery at Abqaiq actually took place on my birthday. <laughs> and Honestly. Yeah, I know. Um, and believe me, there were a lot of raised eyebrows in the Gulf states and in Israel when this happened, because I started to go dark about a year ago as to where I saw the region going and um, came to the conclusion that we were going to enter a new phase of conflict between the Israelis and the Iranians, and that the impact would be most directly felt in the Persian Gulf, or the Arab Gulf, depending on who you're talking to. And in April, I was in Riyadh, and I shared with my friends there that there was going to come a time in the not too distant future when they would get a call and they would say, you know, we've just been attacked in a very, very big way. And I told them the reason for it would have to do with what was going on in the north, in the Fertile Crescent, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. I don't know whether they believed it, but they certainly remembered it. So you told it directly to your interlocutors yes. in Arab world, let's say, yes. and Israel? Yes. Okay. In July, I became even more convinced, and that's when, soon before we had lunch, in fact, um, now that you remind me, um, that's when it became very clear to me that um, Israeli attacks in Syria and Iraq, and what really confirmed it was a drone strike in Beirut, Lebanon, um, were going to lead to an Iranian reaction. The combination of very strong sanctions on Iran with the fact that Israelis were killing Iranians in significant numbers, Iranians, not just Hezbollah, not just Shia expeditionary forces, not just Hashtar Shabi or, or, or um, Kataib Hezbollah 
in uh, Lebanon, in uh, Iraq, real Iranians. There was no way that they would not strike somewhere. But the Iranians are brilliant people, absolutely brilliant. And they are certainly the most serious and worthy of respect adversaries that we have seen in decades. They would not give the Israelis a war in the north. They would not take the bait. But when they saw around this time that President Trump was unwilling to retaliate for the loss of a drone, and we're not talking about one of those little toys, we're talking about a $180 million piece of equipment. They understood the man. They understood that he was not going to take any risks that could cause an economic disturbance, which he knew could ultimately, if it didn't go well, lead to his losing in the next election. They read the political landscape in Israel, and they said, we're not going to give the Israelis a war, not before the election. And they read the political landscape here, and they understood, as one Iranian analyst put it, that the president was not a lion, but a rabbit. <laughs> and they judged correctly. They saw that a series of provocations went unmet. You had an attack in Fujairah in the UAE. You had a shipping incident in the Arabian Sea. Um, Saudi Arabia has been the target of hundreds of missile attacks from the Houthis. They saw that the drone would go undefended. And just to make sure that they had no um, doubts, the president made it a point to undermine his own people's policy towards Iran by saying, we do not want regime change, we do not want war, we want to make Iran great again. And they understood they have immunity. So rather than giving the Israelis the war that they wanted, they effectively emasculated the Gulf countries. And the net result of this is that they understood they're alone. To compound it, because Abkhaz happened one day after John Bolton left the administration, to compound it within days for no reason, literally no reason that anyone can justify, we abandoned the Kurds. If there was any illusion left that the United States would not stand with an ally, but that every ally and friend that we have could be sacrificed on the altar of expediency, it was the betrayal of the Kurds coming so quickly after American inaction. Whatever one might want to say about Obama, and as you say, I thought that the, that the nuclear deal was a bad deal, not because I'm against a deal with Iran, to the contrary. Um, I'd love for us to have good relations with Iran. Brilliant people, and as you very well know, many of my closest friends, most of my closest friends are Muslim, and many of them are Iranian. But there's a problem, and unfortunately, the second aspect of this evening, it's not only to talk about the Kurds who have experienced genocide, but it's also to ask the question, is never again a slogan? Or is it a harbinger of the next one? Could it happen again, and if so, where? I've thought long and hard about whether or not I would make these comments this evening. But unfortunately, I feel that I must. There is a war taking place in plain sight 
a war between Israel and Iran. The Israelis are killing Iranians. The Iranians use proxies like Islamic Jihad to kill Israelis in Ashkelon. They use the Houthis to attack Abha. They um, effectively have found ways to be able to insulate themselves through proxies from, Iranian, from Israeli counterattacks. I believe that that time is going to come to an end and that Iran proper is not going to be immune to Israeli counterattacks. Now, over the course of the past months, there has been a rising chorus within Iran, including the Supreme Leader, Ali Khamenei, including Jafar Salami, who is the head of the Revolutionary Guards, and many other high officials within Iran, speaking of annihilation, eradication, and wiping out of Israel. History teaches the Jews that they don't even have mountains as friends when push comes to shove. The Jews and the Kurds have a common brotherhood of shared history. But the reality is that if one were to ask the question, where could the next genocide happen, one would have to say, between Israel and Iran. Now, the good news is that there's nothing in 2,500 years of history between Iran and the Jews to suggest that such a conflict is inevitable. Relations may not have been perfect, but nonetheless, they were certainly better for the Jews um, in Iran than the Jews faced in Christendom, including up till 1979 when the monarchy was overthrown. In fact, when the monarchy or the Persian monarchy was first created in 550 um, by Kurosh, um, or more commonly known Cyrus the Great, arguably Cyrus became the first Philo-Zionist in world history. The Jews were, proverbially, crying by the rivers of Babylon, having been taken there as captives by Nebuchadnezzar. And Cyrus, when he conquered the Babylonians, he told the Jews, if you wish to return back to your homeland, you're welcome to do it. You can worship who you want. You will just be a vassal state, a satrap, satrapies, pay your taxes, go with your God. If you want to stay, you can stay. And many chose to stay in Persia. Many chose to go back to Judea and create their own state. We don't have very many examples of Philo-Zionism in history. The fact that it happens to be the first Iranian king is interesting. And all the way until 1979, the Jews were very well treated in Iran. In 1979, everything changed within Shia Islam. Now let me take just a couple of steps back because unfortunately, this is a takeaway from this evening that people need to understand. And as you know, as George Santayana put it, those who forget the past are condemned to repeat it. Under Shia Islam, Shiism is approximately 10% of the Muslim world. Under Shia Islam, until 1979, it was axiomatic that there was a separation between church and state. This was enshrined in a constitution in Iran in 1906. When the father of Mohammad Reza Pahlavi, the last Shah, overthrew the Qajar dynasty in 1925, he wanted to declare a republic. His hero was Ataturk and he was a military man, and he wanted to follow in that example. But both the British and the clergy said, no, you have to be a king, because that's the way it is. Under Shia Islam, the Shah, the king, is the custodian 
of the Shia all over the world. This is the way it was all the way through the 30s, the 40s. In 1953, the famous coup in which the CIA and the British MI6 participated, but which ultimately succeeded when the military combined with the clergy to overthrow Mohammed Mossadegh. The clergy was dominated by the highest realm of the ayatollahs, the grand ayatollahs, the marjas, the, the seers, the, the, the greatest of the great. They were dominated by those who were monarchists, by far. There were only one or two who even thought about opposing the monarchy, which is why they participated in bringing back the Shah in 1953. This is extremely important. The leading cleric was a man by Bourgerdi, Ayatollah Bourgerdi. Acting through Ayatollah Kashani, he made sure that the Shah was returned to his throne in 53. In the 1950s, a young but rising cleric named Khomeini was inspired to start thinking of an Islamic government, but he would not act while Bourgerdi was alive. Bourgerdi dies in 1961. In 1963, Khomeini is already getting into trouble. And there are riots, and those are put down forcefully, not by the Shah, because the Shah did not like to shed blood. It wasn't really his nature. He was very vacillating, but by his prime minister, Asadullah Alam. Through the 1960s, Khomeini is sent into exile in Najaf, which is really probably the holiest city in Shia Islam. In 1970, Khomeini gives a series of lectures, which are put into a book. It's not very big, it's about 150 pages, and it's called Islamic Government. Or guardianship of the Islamic jurists. And Velayat Fahi is now used as shorthand for rule by the clerics. This was against Shia Islam. And in fact, of the 12 grand ayatollahs at the time of the revolution, all but one of them, who subsequently recanted that in 1988, in Beheshti, all but one of them were against the idea of giving the government over to the clergy. Khomeini was alone in this. Now, Khomeini didn't have very many allies, but in the 1970s, he, his clerical revolutionaries, even when he was in exile, and also very leftist revolutionaries, the Mujahideen, were given assistance and training by the Palestinians in Lebanon. The Palestinians helped to support and train those who would eventually move and be the military arm against the Shah. Khomeini felt loyalty towards them, and he felt a hatred of Israel which was very close to the Shah. There was military collaboration, intelligence collaboration, agrarian collaboration. And the first visitor, first foreign leader to visit Tehran after the revolution was Yasser Arafat. And he was given the keys to the Israeli legation, the embassy. These aren't conspiracy theories. Khomeini rewarded his friends. All's fair in love and revolution. However, after 2,500 years of relative quiet, the concept of anti-Zionism became one of the major principles of the Islamic revolution. It really came into activation by some mistakes that the Israelis made. In 1982, they invaded Lebanon. Up until then, the Shia minority in Lebanon was not militarized. 
There was a Shia group called Amal, led by a relative moderate named Nabih Bere. The Israelis entered South Lebanon as invaders. They were welcomed by the Shia who wanted to be rid of the Palestinians. They didn't treat them extremely well. And the Shia were revolutionized. And an ayatollah named Fadlallah, with the Iranian help, created an organization called the Party of God, more commonly referred to as Hezbollah. And Hezbollah became the resistance to get the Israeli occupation out of Lebanon. The Israelis took them a while to understand what was going on with them, and they started to kill Hezbollah and treat them as an enemy. And they killed a number of Hezbollah's leaders. The Iranians and Hezbollah didn't have the means to be able to strike at Israel, so they struck at softer targets around the world where they had cells, particularly in Argentina, where they destroyed the AMIA center, the community center, and the Israeli embassy. That began a Israeli-Iranian adversarialism that otherwise had not yet existed. Around that time, you started to hear Iranians refer to Israel as a one-bomb country. One bomb meaning one bomb over Tel Aviv, and effectively, Israel ceases to function as a nation state. Whereas, as they said, this is Hashem Rafsanjani, so a former president of the country, we could take a number of nuclear weapons and still survive. The problem is this. The problem is very one-sided. I've never met an Israeli who's ever said, I'd like to kill Iranians, or I want to attack Iran, or I want to destroy Iran. I've never met one of any political persuasion. We see in public senior Israelis, uh, senior Iranians using the language of annihilation to refer to their end game against Israel. Last week, there was a reference by one of the senior military figures saying, we now have Israel cornered on all four sides. We have encircled Israel. And when you encircle someone, you create a countdown. Who's going to strike first? The Germans had this. They were always caught between Russia and France, and their greatest fear was what they called Einkreisung, encirclement. So here's the ironic situation. Bibi Netanyahu is commonly referred to as being a fearmonger and a panic monger for political purposes. And admittedly, there's not very much that he wouldn't do um, to stay in power. But this is very well known. It's not an insult. The reality is that when it comes to his clarion cries regarding Iran, he's right. Whatever I may think of his politics, he's right. The irony, of course, is that when you look at the coalition arrayed against him, the blue and white of Benny Gantz, Gabi Ashkenazi, uh, Bogi Yaelon, Yair Lapid, amongst those four, three of them are former chiefs of staff. So the irony here is that there's never been a better case for Israel having a unity government because the guys who you want potentially dealing with this situation are in blue and white. But it's Bibi, regardless of whether he's in the coalition or not, who has actually been calling it right. And what I understood over the last year was that the Israelis will strike at the Iranians, the, Isra the Iranians will hit back indirectly, as they would hit back in Argentina for attacks in Lebanon. But the, the combination of Iranian panic at the economic uh, crisis that they're experiencing because of sanctions and the fact that they're being attacked creates a tinderbox, which has been made even more dangerous by 
American passivity in not drawing red lines. The Americans never told the Iranians, privately or publicly, don't you dare think of attacking Abqaiq, the, the refinery, or other strategic installations. To the contrary, they were saying, you might be able to call our bluff, and the Iranians did. As with a child, if you don't show boundaries and you don't show rules, you don't know where they're going to stop. The Iranian strategy has been the Leninist precept, thrust with a bayonet. If you encounter mush, proceed. If you encounter steel, withdraw. Unless the Iranians understand that there are limits, the possibility that we could wake up again at 3 o'clock in the morning and find out that something just happened, either calculated or miscalculated, and we're dealing with a regional war that's taking place not only between Israel and Iran, but also spreading very quickly to the Gulf states, then we're making a huge mistake. And that will not be able to wait until the election. And only the United States can step in to tell our friends in Israel, in the UAE, and in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and our other allies in that region, we will not allow the Iranians to continue to push through mush. If you want to send that message to Iran, the very worst way to do it <laughs> is by abandoning the allies with whom you share not only common interests, not only a brotherhood in arms, but also, as you rightly put it, common values. They are the closest thing to an enlightened force in that region, and they've done it under the most horrible circumstances of war. They haven't said the exigencies of war require us to suspend all rights. No, people have more rights there than in any other part of the Levant. That tells you the kind of people that we're dealing with, that tells you the kind of people that we've just abandoned, and what you and I referred to in the Washington Post as the American Munich. So in being able to draw that connection between the Kurds, and you'll excuse me for the history lesson, but it's about time we understand what we're dealing with. There already is a war in the Middle East. It can escalate at any moment. And for all of us out there who care for Israel, who care, as I do very much, for my brothers in the Emirates and for the Saudis who are trying to make their way through a reform process while the Turks and the Iranians are going backwards. This is a time when we have to stand up for our friends because if we don't do it now, we could be dealing with a situation that we have not seen since the Second World War. My dear Tom, it's, a, it's the first time I come to the Y and uh, listen. Uh, <laughs> but it was, no, it, it was a great lesson of, of history. I agree on most of you said, um, except that if you are right, and I listen to you very carefully, if you are right, we might be at the heart of darkness. I care for Israel, as you, for Israel first. And for me, I don't see what is a way out of the dead end because America has lost its um, power of uh, deterring, of drawing red lines not only with Trump. Trump took the story to a terrible and shameful climax. But already, when Barack Obama, and I, I liked him, if I had been American, I would have supported him. And, and I, okay, but when he drew the red line 
against the use of chemical weapons. And when the red line was crossed, when he decided after a tour in the garden of the White House not to react, a bad engrenage, a bad machinery was set. And honestly, even if tomorrow Donald Trump said by a vibrant tweet, we will stand, <laughs> we will stand aside our Abu Dhabi friends, I would be Iranian, I would not believe. I would be Hezbollah, I would not give a shit, honestly. <laughs> this is the problem. Second problem is that um, this I say it since long. Israel is um, a great country, uh, an example of democracy, not, o not only as it is often said in the area, but for the world. I don't know so many places where um, uh, multi pluri-ethnicity is practiced at this level, where a, a minority which can be hostile to the principle of the state uh, has absolutely equality of rights, and so on. It's a model of democracy. But there is a problem in Israel since the beginning, which is a recurrent problem in Jewish history, which is a problem with politics, with sovereignty. Since the time of the King Gedeon, uh, since the second book of Samuel, we know that Jews are the best for book, are the best for a study, are the best even when, if it, if it is not so much said, that we have a representative, Mrs. Recanati, in this room with art, but they are bad in politics. <laughs> and I know since uh, 50 years, I went in Israel, my first trip 50 years ago. Uh, at the time of the war of six days, I wanted to enlist myself, to embed myself in the Israeli army. I met all the prime ministers of Israel since this time. They spoke, some of them, brilliantly about Talmud. They were specialists of holy history. They were great, except when the, act, when the need was to confront the political reality and to have an attitude matching with that. And this problem with politics has reached a summit with Netanyahu. So the uh, nullity of America, the mediocrity of uh, Netanyahu in terms of politics, his deep pessimism, it is not only nullity, but he has, in, in, to deal with politics, you have to have a reasonable amount of pessimism, but a little push of optimism. He does not have. Plus the fact that in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, Shia and Sunni, and we might disagree on that, I don't know, there is a huge inner war inside the Muslim world. The real clash of civilization, there is only one. It is inside Islam, between obscurantism and fanaticism on, on one side, and enlightenment on the other side. And in the Shia world, as in the, in the Sunni world, I don't know which one is prevailing. What you describe for the Shia world is completely true. It is, a, it is such a pity to see how this great uh, Shia civilization and so on uh, derived in this theocracy absurd and, uh, and killer. But in the Sunni world, we have, alas, a real war between your friends in Abu Dhabi on one side, who are doing their best, who are embracing uh, uh, all that they can of the universal values of, 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 uh, of human rights, but you have on the other side uh, uh, Qatar, Muslim Brotherhood, and so on, and I would not predict who will win. About, about Iran, there is one detail that you maybe uh, underestimate. It is true that the history of Persia and Jewish, or Persian and Jewish people was a good history, except one episode. Except one episode which happened in 1935 when 
the old Persian state, nation, empire, whatever, decided to rename itself Iran, officially. As you know, there was a telegram sent to all embassies of Persia all over the world saying, starting from this moment, we are no longer Persian, but Iranians. Why did they do that? It was the time of the black shining of the Nazi uh, ideology. There was a request, a demand, a program of uh, the Hitlerians saying to the Persians, at the end of the day, we are both Aryan. Aryan in Persia can be said Iran. And we propose you to make a pact, to make an axis of spirit between Aryans of uh, Germany and uh, Aryans of uh, uh, near Asia. And we will make a great deal and a great adventure. So there is also this, what I mean, is that in the Shia world, as in the Sunni world, there is this skeleton in the cupboard. There is these... You're exaggerating it. No. Yeah, no, 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 you are. They flirted with the Germans because they were under, um, they, were, they were under the control of the British and the Russians. Reza Shah was forced into exile, and that's when Mohammad Reza was put on the throne. But Iran pre-exists the Nazis. It, not the you're, name. You're, yes, not, yes, yes, yes. Iran, name. Iran, the concept that, it, that the Iranian nation pre-exists the Nazis, it's a little bit of a, uh, it, it's a little bit of a slander against the Iranians. I don't believe that I'm stepping up um, to defend Iran. Um, but the fact is I'm not anti- Every, Everything it, happens tonight. Every, everything happens at the Y. The fact is I'm not anti-Iranian. And that's a very important point to remember. I remember when Brett Stevens interviewed Bernard Lewis uh, here at the Y. And Bernard Lewis, for those of you who may remember, he passed away a few years ago, was one of the most eminent scholars of the Islamic world, Princeton. And he was asked a question at the end, amongst the questions. What do you think about Turkey? And Bernard said, I usually do the accent, but it, I'm not going to attempt it here. But Bernard said, you may think these are the musings of an old man, but I can see in the not too distant future a day when the most liberal government in the region will be Iran and the center of Islamic fanaticism will be Turkey. Okay. Okay. I, I don't say, I, I'm, I'm not anti, uh, Tom, yeah. I'm, I'm not anti-Radion either. No, I know I, you're not, I just I, but say, I don't think that that skeleton exists. I, I, just, I have to, I, I as, a point, mean, as a point of order, I don't believe that that skeleton exists. Okay. I believe, I believe that, no, no. Anyone have Google? I believe in, in, in a few words, and then we have, I think, <laughs> to reply to the question. I believe that um, the fascist revolution of the 20th century was a worldwide revolution. It was in Japan, it was in Europe, it was in the Arab world, and it was in the Shia world also, and it was in Turkey. You had a whole ideology in Turkey, the Turanian ideology, who shared a lot of points with the Nazi ideology. After the war, Europe at least made the work of uh, mourning, made the work on itself, the work of memory. It was hard, it was difficult, it took some time, it took some, 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 some tears, it took some breaks in the families, and so on. My, what I want to say is that it is not, of course now we are in emergency, but what will have to happen in the Muslim world in general is a similar work of mourning. The, the, the Muslim world cannot continue to say uh, the Nazism was a European matter. We have nothing to do with that. If we had complicity with the Nazis, it was just because we were anti-British. 
and because it was a neo uh, an anti-colonial way, uh, it was a way of expressing our anti-colonialism. You, it cannot uh, be reduced to that. And I know, and you know also, that you have more and more scholars in the Sunni world, in Morocco, in Algeria, in Abu Dhabi, who are beginning this work, who are starting to say, for example, that the Muslim Brotherhood was not just a fundamentalist movement, that it was not just a pious uh, movement, that it was shaped um, according to the pattern of the SS or SA of the 20s. It is a fact. And as long as the inheritors of the Muslim Brotherhood, starting with Erdogan, receive, uh, refuse to accept this truth, I believe that there will be this skeleton in the cupboard. So, yes, the emergency. Yes, and I'm shivering when I listen to that, the risk of this um, terrible escalation, which would mean for Israel annihilation. But on the long run, if we step out this canyon of, uh, of hell, on the long run, we have to help our Shia and Sunni friends to, to deal with this dark part of their own memory. We, the European did it, the America did it, even if you have now a president who <laughs> revives the America first uh, motto, the Muslim world will do it. And m we have to, to, to help him in doing that. That's my point. But we are not obliged to agree on, on everything. We agree on so many, so many things. No, I, I'm, 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 I'm in agreement with you with regard to the schism within Islam between enlightenment and obscurantism. Um, and that's perhaps why I look for those places which I do see as centers of enlightenment, like the UAE. Yeah. That's why I'm um, encouraged by Saudi Arabia's reforms. Those reforms are very real. As many mistakes as they've made, I don't have to go into them. The reality is that putting aside women driving, putting aside cinemas, the fact is that 13,000 of the Mutawin, the religious police, have been fired. Fired. People can now go without wearing the abeya. The guardianship laws are changed. The textbooks are being changed. If Saudi Arabia, the home and the exporter of Wahhabism, can be reformed... This is a fight of today. This, this, is, a fight of this today. is a game changer. This not only points to uh, a paradigm for Iran, but also gives hope to the Sunni world. So I see signs of that kind of encouragement, and I think that let's find the common ground here, that they understand that they have to shed the aspects of the religion um, which have been holding them back. You know, Saudi Arabia has been in a coma for 40 years, since 1979, between fear of the Muslim Brotherhood on the one hand and the siege of Makkah, and the Iranian Revolution on the other hand. So what you're seeing now is I think an attempted reformation coming from what used to be the financier I know, I know, of I know. The, the worst extremism, the madrasas in, in, in Pakistan. One thing that I would point out to you, because it's not entirely a lost cause. Were I the Iranians? We don't know who invented chess. The Iranians say it's them, the Indians say it's them. The Iranians probably invented Shahmat. Checkmate, death to the king, right? Now. The, the worst news of the evening. <laughs> well, not necessarily, because what it means is the joke in the Middle East is that the Iranians play chess while the rest of them play backgammon, play sheshbesh. Um, the truth is that if Iran wanted in one fell swoop to overturn the chessboard, to its advantage, it would make a telephone call, not to Donald Trump. It would make a telephone call to Vladimir Putin, and it would say, you know, 
After the Israelis sort out who's their prime minister, whether it's Netanyahu or it's Gantz, this doesn't matter to us. Give him a call and tell him that we're ready to talk. From that moment on, the threat of annihilation which Iran faces would be gone. The sanctions would go away. The investment would flow in. It would be the game changer for Iran. The fact that they can't act in their own rational self-interest has to be very disturbing to us. If you think back in 1944, the Nazis gave priority to the trains taking Jews from Hungary to Auschwitz, then troops to the Russian front. Now, admittedly, it wouldn't have changed the course of the war, regardless of what they were using the trains for. But there is something about the pathology of hating Jews so much that you act against your own self-interest that has to be very disturbing to us. Because pushing the Israelis into the corner, when the Israelis are the only country in the region with the military means to annihilate Iran, and being pushed into a position where they perhaps have justification for a first strike is irrational. Now, you could say, well, it is rational in the sense that maybe they don't want to destroy Israel. And I happen to believe that the Iranians are rational enough that they will not drop a bomb on Israel just for the sake of it. And they would never risk the second strike capability that the Israelis have from multiple corners to be able to hit them back and to destroy them as a nation state. I don't believe that they would do that unless the regime were falling. If the regime were to fall and they had those weapons, all bets are off because at least they would be giving the Ayatollah Khomeini one gift for posterity. But if the Iranians were to take the off ramp and to say, let's talk with the Israelis, we both have Arab minorities, but we're not Arab countries, majority countries. Let's talk. This would put my friends in the Gulf in a very, very awkward position. This would put the Americans in a very awkward position. This would be the end of Iranian isolation. If they don't do it, maybe we should draw some conclusions from that. So there is hope because the option exists. There's nothing inevitable about it. But having said that, the fact that it exists and that option is not taken must be a source of consternation. Let me see if, with Kurds in Turkey and in Syria and Iraq, what would be the nature of justice for the Kurds? Number one, moral support immediately. And number two, in the long run or in the mid run, the proof is done that they need a state. When, um, when a people is so constantly, unfairly betrayed, condemned, martyrized, and so on, the proof is there that being stateless is, an, uh, and is, a, is a dead end. So now, more than ever, I, I have always been an advocate, uh, even in the 80s, in the 90s, at the, uh, in the time of uh, François Mitterrand and Daniel Mitterrand in my country, but today, after what happened in 2017 and what happened recent now, I don't see how the international community, if the world still means something, cannot refuse to these people uh, a shelter, a little state. It exists in a way. In Iraq, in this failed state which is Iraq, there is one part of the failed state which works, which is a quasi-state, which is the KRG, the Kurdistan region. This for me should be, if we had a diplomacy, uh, pro proper diplomacy, if we, the West, had a vision of the world, this should be a, a near target to help KRG, this, uh, 
You know, in, in the Bible, when all the calamities uh, fall on the people of Israel, the prophets always say that there is a rest of Israel. A rest will come back. Today, in the current situation of the Kurds, there is a rest of Kurdistan that is uh, spared for, for the moment from this uh, uh, thunderstorm, which is the Kurdistan in Iraq. The one I, I, I know, the one I filmed, the one where I left some brothers. This can be the, the cell, the stem cell, the starting point, the fortress of a future Kurdistan. This is what I advocate in my country. This is why, when I have the chance to, 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 be to, to be asked by him, this is what I suggest to my president. Uh, this is what I would suggest to your president if I had uh, uh, the chance, at the end of the day, to meet him, to support this rest of Kurdistan, to fortify this uh, fortress of the Kurdish people. This is now, it has become crystal clear that without that, one century after the Trianon treaties, after our already lack of promise, this is the only way if we want to avoid the Kurds to be the next genocide people. We're in the 92nd Street Y, and it's sometimes been referred to as, with the Wailing Wall, one of the holiest sites in the Jewish world. <laughs> I want to ask you this question. In the green room, when we were sitting with our friend Thane, he asked me a question, and I want to ask it of, of you. And he said, the Kurds are the largest ethnic group the largest population without their own country. Why do we never refer to them as being under occupation? What distinguishes them from, say, the Palestinians? And we've had, I don't even know whether we've even discussed the Palestinians. I think I'm an endangered species. I still believe that we're Jews and we should figure out a way to have a two-state solution with these people. But putting that aside, Everywhere where the Kurds have been allowed self-government, there's been no Hamas. There's been no, you know, there, there's been no Gaza. They've managed to create a civilized, enlightened life for their men, women, and children. Why don't we refer to them as under occupation? Because we are afraid. Because Munich, that, that was a European category, has become, unfortunately, also an American category. We are afraid of uh, annoying Erdogan. We are afraid of disturbing Khamenei. Uh, we are uh, afraid of uh, putting oil in the fire of Iraq. We are afraid. And uh, not only each time they had uh, autonomy, they created civilization, but I strongly believe that far a Kurdish state or a growing autonomy uh, ending with, with a state. Far from creating disorder, mm -hmm. instability in the area, would be a huge and considerable factor of stability. I, in, the, in the map of the Middle East, as, I, as we all dream of it, there, could, there is a pole of stability, which is Israel, for sure, there is another one, which is uh, Emirates, Abu Dhabi, uh, for, probably. But there should be a great, in this, in this tripod, a great third foot of stability, which would be the Kurds. Because they are not only an ethnic community. Ethnic has a, it is an, a, a cities, there is a sense of citizenship. There is a sense of being um, free by law, and by uh, uh, rule of state uh, as much as for your root, which is rare in the Middle East and maybe in the world. In the time where we Europeans are corrupted by the venom of populism, 
the Orban, the Salvini, the Le Pen in France, Trump in America. Honestly, when I go to Erbil, I receive some lessons of anti-populism, uh, some lessons of what it means to exist and to stand as a human being uh, by reference and embracement of values, of principles. <laughs> the, the Kurds are not angels. They have uh, uh, fight against themselves, all of that. But this exists. <laughs> this principle of being the son, the fact, the fact that to be the son of an idea is as important as being the son of a soil which is more and more lost in our countries, is still vibrant in this Kurdistan, which I know. So it would be a sense of civilization. It would be a pole of, uh, of stability. And uh, the question of Ten was absolutely right. Our self-interest as, as Americans, as Europeans, and as Jews would be to encourage this stateless nation to have a state. But we don't do it. And all the indulgence uh, um, which um, a lot of Europeans and Americans have for the Palestinians, uh, they don't have it for the Kurds, in spite of all that I said. And this is just because we are cowards. We are, Erdogan is, a, is, an, is an example to be taught in, uh, in war schools of blackmail. Uh, he, this is his way of making politics. He has the weapon of refugees. He treats them, by the way, like uh, poubelle, like bin, like uh, ordure. And he says, if you disturb me, if you put me on nerves, I will throw the rubbish of the refugees, three million, four, uh, four million, uh, across the border. I will send them to you as, as rubbish. Now, he has the weapons of uh, jihadists, of terrorists, because it is a thing which has not been enough said, that the Kurds in Syria and in Iraq are the custody, they have the keys of the jails where the worst guys, where all the al-Baghdadi are detained. Now the keys are in the hands of Erdogan. Erdogan is the, the ward. He has the keys. And he already says, believe me, to his counterparts in the West, again, don't harass me, don't put me pressure, here is a key. You have the keys of the paradise, so-called, uh, in the caliphate or in uh, Iran, and you have the keys of the jails with jihadists in the hand of Erdogan, second blackmail. And he might, he might have other blackmails on other grounds, against some of our, uh, some of the, of the Western leaders. So we are afraid of blackmail. And the Kurds are the victims of that. With your last word, knowing that our Kurdish friends are going to be watching this, I think a lot of people in the region are going to be watching this interview, what would you like to say to them? I would, like to, I would like to say to them, uh, uh, to repeat what I, what I said at the, at the beginning, that what is happening to them is so unfair, so disloyal, so opposite to all the, the beliefs on which our civilizations in America and in Europe are built. But that we are so numerous to be shocked by that. We are so numerous to, to be flabbergasted by such, um, such, a, such a betrayal, and that we are at their side. I don't know what it is worth. I don't know what is the, the weight of this uh, commitment which we show tonight. I would, not, I would certainly not uh, tell our Kurdish friends who look at us that we here and all those who think like us balance the shameful decisions of an American administration turning its back to all the grandeur of American history. 
I would certainly not risk myself in saying that, but I will tell them that you, we exist, that you exist, and when, that when JFK launched itself, that when we made public our existence, we have been overthrown by messages of support. We have been overthrown, and we are overthrown today, at this very moment, by emails of normal citizens, uh, or average citizens of France and of America, by messages of retired or sometimes active generals, of strategists, of thinkers, of senators, of congressmen, who are replying to us, what can we do? What can I do? How can I help? What can we do together? What is the way to assemble a force in order to show to the rest of the world that the West is not reduced to this non-existing Europe and to this um, plotter against America whose program was probably from the beginning to make Russia great again, whose name is Donald Trump. Bernard-Henri Lévy, Tom Kaplan. It is one of the great privileges of my life to be your partner and your comrade and your brother in arms. May we do something to really, really show our friends what can happen when people of goodwill come together to address and redress an injustice. We will show. We will do. I'm sure.